Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our latest uh, webinar from the East Sussex I Group for the new cycle for the CPD points. Um, as usual, this, this uh, webinar will be recorded and will be on our YouTube site, the East Sussex I Group. There is one CPD point for this event for optometrists and dispensing opticians. And at the end, I'll just explain what happens as it's slightly different from the usual CET that we delivered in the past. Um, the webinar should, the talk should last for about 45, 50 minutes, and then there should be about 15, 20 minutes at the end for questions. So at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions, please type them in there. And at the end, I will then present them to Mr. Kashani. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Kashani. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex NHS Trust, specialising in the management of complex medical retina disorders. He performs intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, steroid implants, anterior and posterior segment laser treatments, as well as high volume cataract surgeries. He has previously been the clinical lead for East Sussex NHS Trust and is now the head of the retinal services and uveitis. Tonight he will present a webinar to us on the dodgy discs and this is uh, one of a series of uh, webinars on the dodgy discs. So, Mr. Kashani, thank you very much for your time, and I would like to hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Ian. Sorry, I'm just uh, making sure nobody calls me. So, uh, okay, share screen. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. So, thank you. Let me just run that there. Thank you, everybody, for um, joining in. Um, I hope you've all had a great Christmas and a happy new year. Um, when I initially thought about this subject, I know it was something that a lot of uh, people were um, worried about, especially um, from the point that, um, you know, discs always tend to kind of panic us. And I thought it'd be quite useful to have a few um, lectures um, on this subject, um, but one lecture is not going to be enough to cover everything. So there's gonna be three parts to this lecture. Uh, we're going to do part one today. Um, and you'll be pleased to know that part two and three will be coming later on during the year. There might also be some changes to the way we do the seminars. Um, I've spoken to Ian and Cash, um, and we think it'd be useful to have um, three breaks during the year, i.e. April, August, and December. So there'd be nine sessions, if you like, and two out of nine, COVID allowing, we would like to have face-to-face -face sessions with whoever wants to come. Um, and we essentially just go through clinical cases and interact. And uh, Supremo Ian reckons he could get up to three points CPD for an interactive lesson. And it'd be nice to see everyone anyway. I mean, I'm sure you're all tired of just uh, looking at your screen. So that, that will hopefully happen in the year. And then my, my hope is one day actually to be able to do these um, talks and do, these, do some of these sessions with actually patients involved and you kind of do a ground round type thing um but that that's probably later on during the year and, and you know depending on how things go with COVID. so anyway um i'm going to start about <clears throat> acquired non-congenital abnormalities so that's what today's talk is going to be uh, congenital benign and acquired abnormalities will be the second talk and then the third one will be glaucoma so we're going to talk about symptoms so what symptoms you look out for in somebody uh who may have a disc problem what examination is expected of you. I'm gonna show you the normal disc. So talk a little bit about normal anatomy and what is normal or variations of normal. And then we're going to talk about pathological cases. Now there's some congenital cases which are not covered in this um, topic. Congenital can be benign and pathologic. Um, and that will be the second lecture which I'll do later on in the year. And there are obviously acquired disc abnormalities which we're gonna talk about today. And then really I'm hoping to kind of finish off with just describing how you would approach the abnormal disc and have some final thoughts. So here is, not what, here is what is not covered. And as I said, this will be the second lecture. So with respect to benign congenital lesions, melanocytomas um, around the disc, optic disc colobomas, disc drusen, and a tilted disc. So these are congenital benign conditions and the pathologic ones are optic disc uh, pit morning glory syndrome and um, there is that one there which I should actually I can't get, can get the name oh 
Sorry, I put the slide there. That's really bad, isn't it? I don't know what it is. I'll come back to it. Oh, sorry, Liebers. So that's Liebers, hereditary optic neuropathy. Um, Ian's picture was covering that. So uh, I need to get rid of that. I hope no one really wants. So um, symptoms of optic nerve damage. Okay, so obviously the symptoms depend on the cause and these symptoms are by no means um, kind of exhaustive, but some patients may not have any symptoms. You know that because you know patients with primary open angle glaucoma don't actually have any symptoms. Um, you might have ocular pain um, and that's something that you can see in arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. There might be pain on eye movements that that's particularly important in patients with optic neuritis where you've got pain on eye movements and that's the the nerve sheath moves uh, with uh, eye movements you can that can elicit pain blurred vision is one of the commonest symptoms obviously if your nerve is involved or damaged uh, from any cause really uh, the vision can go blurred and that can be any inflammatory infective compressive lesions which we'll talk about later on um, contrast sensitivity, um, again, various causes can do that. And color vision. Color vision is one of those really important things that is a very sensitive marker in acquired optic neuropathies. Not so much in glaucoma, although it does actually go down in glaucoma as well. But, um, you know, optic neuritis and um, um, kind of uh, other, other conditions that can affect the optic nerve, like neuritis, can really affect your color vision. So, in glaucoma, we know color vision tends to be preserved till later on, whereas in optic neuritis and other uh, conditions, ischemic or inflammatory, that can be affected quite you know, sooner than later. Visual field uh, defects, and that can very much depend on the condition that you have. So with vitamin B12 deficiencies um, or you know, toxic optic neuropathies, you can expect a central sequel or central scotoma, uh, whereas peripheral vision loss is associated more with things like advanced glaucoma. Um, and of course, ischemic lesions can give you um, um, monocular or binocular hor um, visual field defects which respect the horizontal meridian. Um, red eye, again, if you have an inflammatory or infective cause, uh, flashing lights actually with optic nerves that can happen with optic neuritis and something called UTOS phenomenon, which is when your vision goes down with an increase in body temperature. That's another sign of demyelinating um, optic neuropathy. So with just a wide range of symptoms, a lot of which you could have probably guessed, uh, ranging from pain, redness, reduced vision, um, and you know, positive scotomas. Uh, but obviously just one of the main things I want you to think about is that reduced color vision, which a lot of us don't do. So if you get a red pin, that can often help you. And investigation or examination is like what you normally do for everything else, but there's some that are more extensive than others with your um, optic nerve disease. So you'll all do a Snellen chart. So when you're referring or examining a patient with optic neuropathy, we expect to know what the vision is and the best corrected vision. Nobody has a co contrast in 30, or, or if you do, uh, that's good. But you know, a Snellen chart is a very artificial way of measuring vision, black uh, letters versus a white background. Um, and patients might actually do a lot better than they really are. So contrast charts are pretty good with respect to that. And the chart can be useful, not just for um, AMD, but actually if you've got a central scotoma or a positive scotoma, they can pick that up. I can't stress um, color vision enough. Again, you know, if you see a disc that doesn't quite look right, check the color vision. If the color vision is affected, that's a big sign. Um, and then moving on to kind of more uh, examinations, relative afferent defect, I'm sure you all know what that looks like. If not, go on YouTube, put in RAPD and see, uh, uh, that um, it again tells her sign of optic neuropathy. Um, all it shows with RFED is, is that one nerve or one side is worse than the other. You can actually have uh, RA, no RAPD if both discs are affected to the equal amount. So if your right and left disc is damaged to the same degree, you won't pick an RAPD up. You'll only pick up when one is better than the other. So it doesn't mean your other side is normal. It just means one side is better than the other. Um, and light near dissociation, again, another thing that you look for when you're examining the, uh, the eyes. Obviously, eye movements, why do I say that? Because you, know, you can get kind of issues with um, pain when you're moving the eye, but also you know, if you're trying to kind of localize where the optic nerve might be damaged, you know, it's good to know whether the third, fourth, and sixth nerves are also involved as well. So this can localize midbrain or cavernous sinus or intraorbital aspects of where on the tract uh, or on the uh, pathway your optic nerve has been damaged. 
all of you pretty much have OCT. So you can do an optic nerve disc scan. Um, again, we use it mainly for glaucoma. I think it's difficult really to use it for anything else because normative data is not great, but some of you uh, use it in cases where you think there's this swelling and see if there's swelling of the retinal nerve fibrillae, but hopefully through the lecture today, I can teach you other ways of doing that. Um, obviously a slit lamp, you look at the optic nerve itself. Um, please make sure that you check pupil reflexes first, then you look at the optic nerve. You need to do that really with a dilated fundus exam to have a good look at the optic nerve. Uh, visual field, another um, important investigation that is really important when you're trying to um, look at optic nerve function. Um, and then we've got more kind of in, uh, more, more studies that are probably a bit more invasive. So we've got MRI, so neuroimaging. Um, this is a picture of optic distrusion in a patient who um, has had um, fundus autofluorescence. So you can see bits of drusen showing very nicely there. Uh, sometimes you might not see drusen if they're buried and if they're not at the optic nerve head. So and finally here, we've got electrophysiological tests for checking um, VEPs, um, uh, visual evoked potentials to check if there's any optic nerve damage. So within your office, really, you can do vision, color vision, Snellen, um, disc OCT, visual fields. Um, this is obviously, you probably don't have, or pupillary reflexes, of course, and slit lamp. But you probably don't have access to um, neuroimaging, um, fundus autofluorescence, ultrasound, and electrophysiology. But I think you can probably get a lot of information just from what you can do within your practice. Now, before we go forward with respect to what may or may not go wrong, it's just good to know what the optic nerve pathway is. So you all know that the nasal side cross at the chiasm and the temporal kind of carries on. Um, the optic nerve carries 1.2 million afferent uh, nerve fibers, and most of them go to the lateral genicular um, nucleus. But there are some others that go in other uh, places, so they don't all go to LGN, such as the pretectal uh, nuclei, and that's for your kind of pupil reflexes. In that 1.2 million, there are about 600 bundles, each containing around 2,000 nerve fibers, making up the 1.2 million. And it's really important uh, to know that actually a third of your 1.2 million afferent nerve fibers serve the central five degree, and that's absolutely huge. And apart from your kind of um, nerve uh, fibers, you've also got other structural um, cell types like oligodendrocytes, microglia, and astrocytes. And you know these are kind of cells that can proliferate in tumorous conditions like astrocytoma or uh, you know oligodendrocytoma and things like that, which can affect the optic nerve. But um, you know these are kind of more supportive cell lines. The picture here um, is kind of quite a nice representation. So you've got the temporal aspect of your uh, retinal nerve fiber layers going on uh, to, towards your, um, sorry, you've got the nasal aspect going towards your optic disc. These are, these are crossed. And then the bits that are coming from the temporal are not crossed. And the papillomacular bundle contains bits of crossed and uncrossed. So um, it, yeah, I'm sure you, you've all kind of uh, seen that before. And within your optic nerve, um, you know, the most inner um, kind of part that comes with is kind of the macular part, as you can expect. And then the rest are arranged in such fashion. So you've got the blue bit, which is kind of the most peripheral bit, and that's inferior. And then the kind of light blue bit, that's at the top. But the macular bit, which is coming from the center, is bang in the middle. So, um, and that's important when you're looking at visual fields. So just remember that the nasal uh, fibers cross and the temporal ones go forward. Now the normal disc can look different. It doesn't always uh, look the same. And there are mainly three different uh, nerve appearances. One is kind of like quite a, a nerve with what we call a small dimple-like central cup. And these are kind of your really small cups uh, within the nerve that, that you look at. Um, and sometimes you might not even be to see the to see the cup, but you can clearly see here the blood vessels crossing into the nerve. If there was retinal nerve fiber layer edema, you won't be able to see, or you see blunting of these blood vessels. And um, you can get a punched out central cup. So, um, I mean, this is probably not, not a great picture, but you can get some really big physiological cups. So bigger nerves tend to have bigger cups. Again, the retinal nerve fiber, 
of fiber layer or, or the you know kind of the uh, new retinal rim as it were it should be pink and um, it will follow the isentral which we'll come to in a minute so you can have nerves with very small cups ones with uh, bigger cups but obviously you're looking at the health of new retinal rim and then you can have a cup with kind of a sloping temporal wall these are all variations of normal and um with respect to cup dysphagia, so over here we've got a large disc which has a large cup and, and it's entirely normal. Uh, most discs have a cup dysphagia of 0.3 or less. Only 2% have a cup dysphagia of more than 0.7. And you all know that we can tolerate a disc uh, asymmetry, this cup dysphagia of asymmetry between the eyes of about 0.2. Um, if you've got a pathological uh, uh, neuretal rim, then you've got kind of irreversible nerve fiber layer loss with reduced blood vessels and cell, uh, glial cell lines. And as I mentioned to you, you follow the isentral, which means it's thickest inferiorly, then superiorly, then nasally, and then uh, nasally they go, and then temporally. So uh, your nasal side fibers, which are coming from the nasal part, remember it all comes through here, they go across the temporal side, you've got um, come from temporal on the top, temporal at the bottom, and then you've got the papular macular bundle. Um, the papular macular bundle is crossed and uncrossed, and everything else um, I mentioned to you uh, on that picture. Uh, now, when you're talking about abnormal disc, there are several uh, things that come to mind. So first of all, you can have a swollen disc, you might have an atrophic disc, or you might see these optic ciliary shunts. And this is what essentially we're going to go today. So these are acquired cause of optic ner nerve disease. With a swollen disc, um, we'll go through papal edema, uh, ischemic optic neuropathies, compression, papillitis, um, I'm not going to cover labors because that will be covered in a different lecture. And that's hereditary, uh, so congenital. Optic, neuro optic atrophy is end result of many clinical conditions that can be primary or secondary, which again, we'll go through uh, later. Um, optic ciliary shunts, I'm kind of just going to talk about it today. You can just see these abnormal blood vessels. Essentially, uh, they form because of uh, retinal cord of venous collaterals at the optic disc. And that's normally as a result of chronic venous compression from optic nerve um, meningiomas or uh, gliomas of the optic nerve. So they look very different to new vessels or collateral vessels. Um, and it's something that's really rarely seen. So we are really going to concentrate on the top one here, which is this swelling bit, and a little bit on the atrophy. And I won't be going on about optic shunts because they're bloody rare. So this swelling, well, so one of the causes of this swelling is optic neuritis. Optic neuritis uh, can occur for many reasons. A lot of people hear optic neuritis and think, ah, oh, MS. Actually, that's not true. So you can have inflammatory optic neuritis, and you can see this in inflammatory conditions where you've got infiltration of the optic nerve in sarcoid, lupus, poly polyarthritis, nodosa. Um, in infective ones, so sinus-related, cast crash disease, Lyme disease, syphilis, you know, those are other causes of um, kind of optic neuritis. Demyelinating is the commonest cause, so that's normally associated with MS, not always, but sometimes. And then sometimes following viral infections or immunizations. And so that's one way of describing optic neuritis through etiology. And another way is actually where it's occurring. So. If it's retrobulbar, i.e. behind the ne optic nerve head, then the disc may look normal. You will just have the uh, patient with blurred vision or RAPD or reduced color vision, but the nerve head will look completely fine. So that's when you start thinking about retrobulbar neuritis and that, that's kind of what most of MS patients are like because you don't, the nerve head itself is not involved. Um, in papillitis, which is a completely different uh, thing to retrobulbar neuritis, in papillitis, the optic nerve head is the main problem that's uh, been swollen. And that normally happens uh, because there's inflammation of the optic nerve head, or there might be inflammation uh, which might be involving the retina going onto the optic nerve. And we'll come to some examples of papillitis in a minute. But unlike retrobulbar neuritis, you have hyperemia uh, of the disc with disc edema and hemorrhages. So you can see kind of some hemorrhages there. And then um, in neuroretinitis, which I'm sure some of you would have heard of, is very similar to papillitis. So you've got a swollen di disc, retinal fibrillar edema, hemorrhage of the disc, but you also have a macular star. 
So we'll come to all that in a second. So let's start off with the retrobulbin neuritis or um, that you get with um, demyelination. So your nerve cells uh, all have myelin around them. That's what makes sure that the um, nerve fiber conducts the you know, electrical impulses correctly. And when you have demyelination, that doesn't happen. So everything slows down. You can have an isolated optic neuritis, i.e. the patient only has it once and never again. But actually, uh, optic neuritis in general will massively increase your risk of having MS. And in multiple sclerosis, uh, you, know, you tend to have at least two episodes of some abnormal neurology. It doesn't always have to involve the eyes. It can be pins and needles or weakness or something like that. But um, optic neuritis is often a presenting feature of uh, multiple sclerosis. So patients can have neuroimaging and at that point you see if there are plaques in the brain or not. But generally, optic neuritis happens between ages of 20 and 50. It tends to be monocular. Um, you get pain on eye movements, which we know about. You tend to actually, that pain tends to be the preceding factor. So patients got start of having pain when they move the eyes, then the vision massively gets down. Between 618 to 660, there'll be RAPD, absent color vision, you know, things like that. And um, the other eye may or may not look normal. So if the other eye does look a bit pale, then that might indicate that they've had previous uh, inflammation in that eye. And you can get various kind of uh, visual field defects. So here, you know, majority, up to 50% have this diffuse visual field defect with optic neuritis. Uh, about 10% have a superior or an, sorry, 20% have a superior or inferior altitudinal, which almost actually look very similar to ischemic optic neuropathy, if you think about it, but you can get that with optic neuritis. You may have three quadrants involved or just one quadrant involved, or you might have a central sickle. But by and large, it's a constriction, diffuse uh, visual field defect, but other ones are present as well. So uh, with optic neuritis, the main thing to remember happens in a young person preceded by pain, vision goes down, but normally after a few weeks, vision tends to improve. And if the vision doesn't improve or it's happening in somebody who is really young or really old, then you need to think whether either this is optic neuritis or this is atypical optic neuritis and they need further investigation. So normally we, with an isolated episode of optic neuritis, we don't tend to do much. We, ex we follow the patient up, make sure the vision improves. Then at that point, I've probably discussed with the patient if they've had other neurological symptoms. If they haven't, this is purely isolated optic neuritis. You may or may not decide to do neuroimaging. And that's where it gets difficult because if you find plaques, then that might mean that they have a much higher risk of developing MS. And they may not want to know that. But I think if you've had abnormal neurology or, or, or if your optic neuritis is atypical, then you must do neuroimaging because you might have something uh, that you need to uh, kind of, um, uh, it might be something different, like it might be infective or um, inflammatory rather than demyelinating. So as I said, it improves week three and four and it can relapse and remit, so it can come and go. Uh, most patients will have vision of six, nine or better by the time the optic neuritis improved, 85% six, 12 or better, even if the vision drops the perception of light. So there's massive decline and then suddenly uh, it improves. But unfortunately, 10% will have this chronic optic neuritis with stepwise progression uh, of vision. And um, you know, treatment-wise, we don't tend to do anything if it's typical optic neuritis and it only affects one eye. But if it affects both eyes, which it can do, then st IV steroids can help uh, to reduce the um, uh, duration of the condition. Um, and, but they won't really improve the final outcome. So the vision, the final vision will be the same, whether you use steroids or not. There is also um, evidence that interfering beta one alpha uh, will, could reduce development of events over three years after the first episode of optic neuritis. To be honest, we don't start them on that. And we probably refer to neurologists to decide um, whether that needs to happen or not. So I think if you've seen optic neuritis, but if you do, it's, Remember that you're a young patient, pain, vision down, then it improves. You'll have all the optic, uh, you know, RAPD color vision things. It will, optic nerve head will look normal because it's retrobulbous, it'll be behind the optic nerve. Um, so, you, so you're unlikely to see 
any nerve health involvement. It can happen, but it's unusual. And the visual field will be diffusely uh, abnormal. Um, unusually or rarely, you can have optic disc swelling uh, or optic neuritis, as it were, uh, from viral infections like mumps, rubella, uh, whooping cough, chickenpox. Sometimes you can get it after immunization. Um, this kind of tends to go away on its own. And the kind of parainfectious optic neuritis is a lot commoner in children. Uh, than adults. And sometimes it might be associated with other neurological symptoms like ataxia or seizures. Uh, but I've never actually seen one of these. Uh, and as I said, they tend to spontaneously recover, but may need IV steroids. But it's just important to realize it as a cause. You're unlikely to see it in a clinical setting. Um, other causes. So we're now going to infectious cause of neuritis. So if you remember uh, what I mentioned, so uh, if you uh, remember etiology, we've done, inf uh, we've done parainfectious demonity, now we are on the infective side. So within infection, so sinusitis um, can cause um, uh, optic neuritis, and that's because your sinuses are near your eye sockets, so you can get direct, direct spread um, or through bony defects or occlusive vas vasculitis. Um, and sometimes you just need to drain uh, the abscess uh, in the sinus in order to uh, improve things. And that can cause unilateral vision loss or severe headaches. Um, cat scratch disease um, can cause neuroretinitis, so that can cause swelling of the optic nerve head together with um, uh, macular star. Uh, patients will have uh, enlarged lymph nodes. There will be a history of being bitten by a cat, and antibiotics such as azithromycin or doxycycline can help. We had a recent case of these, uh, I think a couple of years ago, and you can't actually now order the blood tests, which is really weird. So um, the patient thankfully responded to azithromycin, otherwise they would have had to have a lumbar puncture to look for Bartonella, but it didn't come to that. But there was history of cat scratch. Other infections, apart from sinus and cat scratch syphilis, so there's a patient with um, lots of lesions on the hands, so it's a secondary syphilis, and syphilis can cause pretty much anything in the eye. If you ever caught up in an exam and they show you something in the eye and you're not sure you can say syphilis, it does everything. Um, so that can cause papillitis and neurotinitis and treatment is with IV antibiotics. Lyme disease, where you see new forest being bitten by ticks uh, from Borrelia uh, Um, That can very much actually mimic MS, so it's another cause of optic neuritis. And you can have um, herpetic disease, which can affect uh, the nerve uh, in acute retinal necrosis or progressive outer, outer retinal necrosis. Now, there are non-infectious causes of optic neuritis. So if you recall, I mentioned to you that sarcoid, so sarcoid is quite important. They can cause inflammation, uh, lupus and uh, polyarthritis and others as well. So they can infiltrate the nerve. And they're very difficult to differentiate um, if other parts of the retina is, are not involved. So sometimes you can get neurosarcoid, which can really look like MS because you've got these sarcoid lesions in the brain and often they uh, are kind of conundrums for neurologists to see uh, what it is. But um, sarcoid tends to affect the choroid and MS doesn't. Uh, but MS can cause intermediate uveitis and um, you know, inflammation in the retina as can sarcoid. So if the choroid is involved, that makes life a bit easier. Otherwise, it can be difficult. And we use steroids or second line agents to treat neurosarcoid. This is a very good picture of um, a swollen disc with, a, with, with exudase or mac macular sac like. So you can see that in neuroretinitis. Neuroretinitis is mainly from cat scratch in 60%, but you can be from Lyme disease, mumps, syphilis, or idiopathic, okay? Um, and often what happens, it tends to resolve with treatment and patients recover. Uh, but symptoms can last for six to 12 months. So it's a bit, it's important to discuss kind of what your, uh, what the blood supply to the optic nerve or what it looks like, because um, we're now going to talk about ischemic optic neuropathies. So if you imagine your optic disc, as you can in this picture, actually, I might start off with here. So you've got internal carotid artery coming up and then ophthalmic artery, which is coming towards the eye, then branches out. And you've got the central retinal artery that goes through the middle of the, uh, uh, the nerve. And you've got these posterior ciliary arteries, which kind of go to the side of the um, optic nerve. And here, 
we now represent what each thing uh, has. So if you divide the nerve into four bits, so you've got the retrolaminal region, okay? Then you've got the laminar crib rosa, and then you've got the paralaminal region, and then you've got the surface of the nerve. So the central retinal artery, uh, which is coming through the middle of the nerve from the ophthalmic nerve supplies the retrolaminar area, and it also supplies the superficial nerve fiber layer. And the lamina, oh, sorry. The lamina and the paralamina bit are supplied by the um, posterior ciliary arteries, which come off uh, the ophthalmic artery as well. Okay, so that's a very nice diagram of showing you how the um, blood supply to the optic nerve is affected. And that's important when we come to discussing ischemic optic neuropathies. So non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, I'm sure you've all seen this, so this patient would present with painless loss of vision, um, often with a, a visual field defect. So in this case, you've got a normal side on the, um, on the right of the picture and on the, um, so on the right, as you're looking at it, you've got a swollen uh, disc um, inferiorly, this is the left eye, and you can see that although the right eye is, is okay, on the uh, left side, you've got an inferior field defect. And that's strange, isn't it? Because that should be, sorry, the, the, the swelling is superiorly. Um, so superior uh, disc defect, uh, disc swelling equals inferior um, field defect. So in non-arteritic skin optic neuropathy, uh, th this is most commonly seen in the elderly, and you can get partial or total infarction of the optic nerve, and that happens as a result of occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries. Remember these ones, okay? Not the central retinal artery. If you've got central retinal artery occlusion, you shouldn't see a swollen disc. If you see a swollen disc, this is because you've got occlusion of the short posterior ciliary arteries. And it typically happens between age of 55 to 70. Um, we discussed the disc at risk because these are discs that have got hardly any cups in them. And there are the predisposing factors like hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, antiphospholipid syndrome, collagen vascular, anything vascular, collagen vascular disease um, are important information of NAIA. Um, a lot of the times patients get this, this kind of vision loss when they wake up in the morning, and that's because they've dropped the blood pressure at night. So sudden hypertension during night, if they take the blood pressure medication at night, they wake up with a swollen disc and loss of vision can be important. Um, medication wise, Viagra is, has been implicated and actually cataract surgery as well. So what do you do about it? Unfortunately, there's no treatment for non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. As I said, in 30%, it's a mild reduction in vision. In 70%, the vision reduction can be moderate to severe. It's painless. It tends to occur in one eye. Very importantly, there are no visual obscurations. Visual obscurations are transient loss of vision, which are very typical of papilledema, uh, i.e. Uh, swollen optic nerves due to raised intracranial pressure. So there'd be no visual obscurations. And it, as I said, it's frequently noted at waking up. But we do look at the patient from a medical history just to check if they've got any cardiovascular risk factors because that's associated. Look at the other eye to see if you can see the disc at risk. Visual field test should show, uh, certainly in uh, cases where it's often affecting the superior or the inferior part of the disc, uh, you should see a visual field defect which is respecting the horizontal meridian, not the vertical, horizontal meridian. Um, color vision should be down as one you would expect, and you can expect to see disc pallor uh, associated with diffuse or sexual edema, and you might also see splinter hemorrhages. The main thing with this is that it's painless. And as I mentioned, we do blood tests. Um, I always, always uh, do uh, check for GCA. Now, you might turn around and say, oh, hold on a second, but you said it's painless. Why would you che check for GCA? Well, 20% of patients with GCA may not present like uh, the way one would expect, we call it occult GCA. So if you see a swollen disc, you must have an ESR and CRP just to make sure that you're not missing anything. Um, this is, I've, I've kind of put that there. You, unless the ESR CRP is raised or um, the patient has headache or anything like that, you wouldn't go on to do temporal artery biopsy. But I've mentioned it here because now we, uh, we not here, but there is an ultrasound way of checking the temporal artery 
and that can show you whether it's blocked or not instead of doing a invasive temporal artery biopsy. So, um, so we check, run the normal bloods, check for diabetes, cholesterol. You might want to do a 24 hour blood pressure. Um, you run ESR, CRP to make sure there's no inflammation. Um, and often, as I said, there's no treatment. We might recommend aspirin if they have cardiovascular risk factors, but starting aspirin probably won't alter the risk of the second eye developing non arthritic um, ischemic optic neuropathy. And uh, vision loss can progress up to six weeks, although it's unusual. Normally, you get the vision loss and it kind of stays very similar to that. But 10% uh, can affect the fellow eye in three years and 15% in five years. So, um, and that particular uh, involvement of the second eye um, happens if, you've ha if your vision is really bad with the first event or if they're diabetic. So that does increase their risk. Now, what we all get excited about is scheme uh, is arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy. So in particular, I'm talking about giant cell arthritis, which you would have all seen. Uh, this picture, really I've put it in there to, to make you realize actually GCA causing blindness isn't the only problem one would worry about. Actually, the re patients can die from GCA and that's because they can have heart attack and strokes. So you can get myocardial infarction, you can get aortitis, um, and this is because GCA is a necrotizing arthritis, so inflammation of the arteries, which affects the large and the medium arteries. And they normally present in the seventh or the eighth decade uh, with headaches, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness. But jaw claudication, this pain when chewing, is almost pathognomonic of GCA. So it's, it's one of the most single important questions you can ask a patient with GCA. If they've got pain when they're chewing food, you've got to think this could be GCA. Um, headaches tend to be temporal, not always. Sometimes they can be frontal. Um, scalp tenderness can be present, so they can't brush their hair. And sometimes you might have very non-specific symptoms like fever, fatigue, muscle pain. A lot of patients may have a condition called polymyge rheumatica where they've got proximal muscle pain. So they will say to you that they can't lift their arms or they can't go up the stairs, which involves their thigh muscles um, and those are kind of your proximal muscles. So very important to think about it. So vision loss is one thing. We'll go through visual um, or ocular uh, effects of um, uh, GCA, but remember all these other things. So, you know, the temporal um, tenderness, scalp, tender, scalp necrosis when it's really bad, hearing loss, non, you know, these systemic symptoms, muscle pain, and of course, you know, they can get um, heart attacks and things like that. And as I said, um, well, well, I think we'll come to we'll come to investigations in a minute. But within the vision side of things, you can get sudden, profound loss of unilateral vision loss. So the vision loss is often really bad. Counting fingers are worse. Uh, they may have visual obscurations, so they see kind of vision going in and out of um, uh, um, uh, focus. Uh, you might they might have flashing lights, uh, but normally. Uh, most cases of vision loss occurs within a few weeks of the GCA going on. Don't always assume that patients with GCA will present the first day. I had a patient who was referred to me and for cataract surgery. Um, and when she was seen, her vision was 612 in both eyes. She was fine. Few weeks had gone by, and when she came, she said, "Oh yeah, I lost my vision. I think my cataract is going bad." Suddenly, lost her vision, and uh, she remembered actually Christmas Day or something like that. Lost her vision, and then when you start asking her questions, she said she's had difficulty chewing her food, and she'd been having headaches, and she went to the GP. and didn't want to take steroids, but um, you suddenly start realizing what's happened. So she had essentially infarcted her optic nerve had a fixed dilated pupil and there was nothing you could do for her. So a so few weeks after symptoms, you can lose vision in one eye and the other eye can get involved if you don't start steroids. And that can happen in 20 to 30% of patients can get contralateral eye involvement. So starting steroids are very important. Um, but as I mentioned to you, up to 20% of GCA patients may not actually have your typical symptoms, what we call the occult GCA, which is why I'm saying if you see a swollen disc, just because they don't have scalp tenderness or jaw claudication, that doesn't mean they don't have GCA. Any swollen disc needs to be urgently evaluated. 
And as a workup, we do urgent ESR and CRP to make sure that they do not have uh, GCA. Um, unlike other causes of a solenitis, you tend to see this very chalky white disc in um, arteritic uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, and they develop severe atrophy quite quickly afterwards. So our treatment strategy often is oral steroids, one milligram per kilogram. If the patient has visual symptoms or they've uh, had kind of optic disc swelling, then they get um, three days of intravenous uh, steroids, and then after that, they'll wind off to oral prednisolone. If it's just the headaches with scalp tenderness and there's no other neurological symptoms, no visual symptoms, then you can start on oral steroids. And we try and get them booked onto a temporary biopsy within a week because the steroids can affect the biopsy. Um, sometimes we, well, you know, I'm aware that in, in certain areas they can use an ultrasound rather than a biopsy. And I don't think we have that in East Sussex yet, but it's something that would be good to get at some point. Um, and, and these steroids are high-dose steroids, so you've got to warn them about the symptoms of, you know, what they're going to get with all this long-term steroid use. Uh, and if you can't wean them off the steroids, then second-line agent like methotrexate or some of these monoclonal antibody biologics might be the way forward to get the patients off. Um, and as I said, that infarction of the nerve is the most common manifestation of um, GCA um, and a third have bilateral involvement, which is kind of bad news. Um, you can get this unusual posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And what that is, is that instead of you seeing the abnormality on the optic nerve head, uh, it kind of involves the retrolaminal uh, portion. So if you, might, if you remember the retrolaminal portion um, is supplied by the short posterior ciliary arteries. And that supplies your choroid as well. So um, when you do fluorescent angiography, not that you would do that in an acute setting, choroidal ischemia um, and high inflammatory markers, again, is very, very typical of GCA. And here I've got a picture of somebody, so, someone with a swollen disc, really horrible whitey looking disc and cotton wool spot. Again, presence of cotton wool spots around this kind of swollen disc should make you think about GCA. And please remember, not every GTA patient will have the typical scalp tenderness, jocular education, and all the things that you normally think about. So um, a swollen disc like that should prompt urgent investigation into the hospital. Sometimes they can have, uh, you know, amaurosis fugax, so they'll tell you, you know, curtain coming down and the disc might otherwise look normal. Uh, I've mentioned presence of cotton wool spot. You can get arterial occlusions, as you can see in here. So mainly central arterial occlusion, with, uh, with GCA. Now remember, when your central atrial artery is occluded, um, so that's coming directly from the ophthalmic artery, which is one of the blood vessels that can get involved in GCA, you're not going to see disc swelling. So you only see swelling of the disc in this kind of setting when you've got the posterior ciliary arteries, which are affecting the nerve, not the central atrial artery. But you all know what CRA looks like. And then very unusually, you might get this ocular ischemic syndrome, which you know, involves um, very ischemic eyes, new vessels, uh, hypotony, and other um, uh, things such as cells on the anterior chamber. That's kind of generally quite unusual. Um, and of course, cranial nerve palsies. So you might get a third nerve palsy or something like that. So again, with those, we always check ESR and CRP. Okay, so that's kind of gone through the blood vessels. Um, now we're going to talk about diabetic papillopathy. This is quite unusual. I've seen it a few times, not often. So you get this really scary looking um, swollen optic disc. Nobody really knows why. It's uncommon. It happens in context of diabetes. Vision is normally quite good, like 6-12 vision, where you look at anything should be much worse. And you get these numerous telangiectasia um, on the optic nerve. Um, Visual field defects, such as central scotomal constriction, can happen. Good prognosis, it tends to spontaneously go away. But um, we're not really sure why you can get this diabetic papillopathy. But if you see a diabetic patient with a swollen looking disc and relatively good vision, then do think about it. If this was you know, non arthritic or something like that, with that level of swelling, your vision would be much worse. Um, and if it's kind of unilateral, you'll expect the RAPD and color vision thing. But I've put it there because, um, you know, it's, it's quite impressive to see. 
more unusual stuff. So toxic optic neuropathy, uh, these patients are the ones who um, drink excessively or smoke quite a lot. They're deficient in vitamin B. They tend to have central sequel um, visual field defect. Um, you've got to really ask them about the kind of, if you've got one that's, that you are thinking that, you know, uh, it's going that way or, or the blood, you've got to kind of really dive into how much they drink because they will underreport it. Um, I had a patient who said she drank normally only a bottle of wine a day. And, you know, when you kind of look into it, you think a few shots after that, you think over 20 years, that's actually quite a lot. So you do have to ask the right questions, but they get, as I said, severe color vision abnormality. Um, it tends to be bilateral because the toxin would affect both eyes. And if you catch it early, you get good recovery. So it's important to measure the vitamin B12 and folate levels and see whether you can replenish. But the telltale sign is obviously in the history and central sequel um, visual field defect with really bad color vision. And then there are just some drugs you need to be aware of, mainly anti-TB drugs, ephambutol, um, amiodron, which is anti-arrhythmia drugs, or vigabatrin, which is an epileptic drug, which can also cause optic neuritis um, and uh, optic neuropathy, sorry. And these patients would be warned to get screened uh, for their eyes anyway. So if they come to you with um, drug information sheets and say, oh, I've been told about this, just do refer them on. Coming kind of towards the end of the uh, lecture, we're going to talk about papilledema. So this is optic nerve swelling secondary to raised ICP, okay? It's almost always bilateral, but it can be asymmetrical. And um, if it's kind of, if you've had papilledema before, and then the condition has recovered, you then develop optic atrophy. If the ice intracranial pressure goes up again, then you might not see the papilledema. And that's because of scarring of the optic nerve head. So it's important to realize that. Um, what you need to make sure is that the patient doesn't have a space occupying lesion, like a brain tumor. You can, of course, get it as a result of anything that causes an increase in your intracranial pressure. So obstruction of the ventricular system, impairment of CSF absorption, malignant hypertension can do it, trauma, blunt trauma causing cerebral edema, uh, and of course, this condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, i.e. everything looks normal, your MRI looks normal, there's no dilation of the ventricles, there's no masses, everything looks okay, but when you do a lumbar puncture, the pressure is very high. I mean, all these things are lecturing themselves, so I'm just kind of giving you a very general overview of everything, but this is kind of how the CSF flows. So you've got CSF here in the um, kind of around the sagittal sinus in the subarachnoid space, these are kind of your ventricles, okay? And then that's going through the spinal cord. So what we are saying is any obstruction in this area can increase the pressure and cause papilledema. So whether that obstruction is happening because of some congenital malformation or where you've got a mass or whether there's problem with absorption, anything that can cause increase in ICP can cause papilledema. And generally patients tend to have headaches, which is worse in the morning. It can wake them up um, from sleep. That's kind of quite important. Um, it can get worse when they bend down or when they cough because that increases the pressure inside the head. Um, and it may or may not be associated with nausea and vomiting. So they've got projectile vomiting. Um, and if it's kind of really progressed, uh, i.e. that's then causing herniation uh, through the foramen magnum, then you can get a reduced level of consciousness and other issues. But with respect to your vision, you can get trans transient visual obscuration. So vision comes in and out, they'll say over seconds. That's kind of quite common in papilledema. Um, of course, you can get double visions like six nerve palsy, especially which is a false localizing sign of raised ICP because it's raised pressure. Um, and papilledema itself can cause vision loss. Although in early stages it doesn't, it kind of occurs more in later stages. And this is kind of a, a, a very nice way of kind of describing where you are on the papilledema pictures. So you can, in a very early papilledema, you can just about see that uh, swelling around the um, optic nerve head. The disc margin is ever so slightly um, indistinct. There will be absence of spontaneous venous pulsations. But don't forget that up to 20% of individuals have an absent SVP. 
So 20% don't have an SVP and that can be normal. So, uh, but, but if you've got early papilledemia, papilledema like that, uh, SVP would be ab uh, absent, uh, but vision can be normal. So you see a slight elevation, that's we've got early papilledema. This is when it's hardest to pick this up, I suppose. Then when it's more established, it's a lot easier to pick up, you, know, you get transient visual obscurations. Even at this level where we call established, it can be normal vision or just mildly reduced. But you can see this very severe um, hyperemia of the optic nerve with hemorrhages. And clearly you now know that the uh, margin is very um, indistinct. And as papilledema progresses, you've got this kind of champagne cork appearance um, of the optic nerve. That's kind of the more long-standing uh, uh, papilledema, um, which is associated with visual field defect and you get constriction of your visual fields, which is why um, in any form of papilledema, it's important to diagnose early, not only because you want to see why that is, but let's say if there's no brain tumor or you know, they've got this idiopathic intracranial hypertension, you bring that pressure down. Because if you don't fix the papilledema long term, they will get constricted visual fields. Um, so it's important to make sure that that's been kind of addressed. And um, you can sometimes get this kind of drusen like deposits in these long standing cases called corpora amylesia, uh, which is you know, something I, I haven't seen, but you know, they, they, can, they can happen. And kind of last stage, you get this atrophy, which can develop if the papilledema is not uh, sorted and you get slight elevation, but vision at this point is very poor. So you can have early established long standing or atrophic. And then there's some differential diagnosis, some of which we'll go through at another lecture. So here, you've got a patient who's got optic disc drusen. Uh, so, you know, you can obviously see the drusen, but often we get referrals for, for this because patient, people are worried that they're missing papilledema. You can see it really looks like papilledema, but you can see abnormal trification of the vessels and you can clearly see the drusen there, but we'll go through that in more detail in my second talk another day. If you've got labors, um, here's your optic neuropathy where you can get uh, swelling of the disc. Uh, this is a patient who has uh, neuroretinitis. So you've got the macular star, you've got papillitis, which is um, uh, swelling of the optic nerve head. Uh, here you've got a patient who has malignant hypertension. So they've got kind of swollen uh, discs, blood pressures through the roof, and you've got hemorrhages on the optic nerve. So actually with cases like this, it's important uh, to just quickly do a blood pressure to make sure the blood pressure isn't through the roof and they're not going to stroke out. Um, compression of the optic nerve in thyroid eye disease, again, can look similar. Uh, you know, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not papilledema because it's not because of raised ICP, but because the optic nerve is compressed. And I can't recall why I put that picture there. Uh, should I put the name on top? Sorry. Um, so you've gone through the optic swollen optic disc, which is papilledema, papillitis, um, and, you know, uh, ischemic optic neuropathies, um, etc. And the other thing we we're going to talk about was optic atrophy. So optic atrophy can be primary or secondary. Um, let's do secondary first. So secondary is what we've discussed about. It's often preceded by a swollen nerve. So uh, you can kind of look this dirty gray or chalky like uh, optic nerve. Uh, and that can happen after chronic papilledema papillitis or anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So this is a secondary optic atrophy because the nerve was swollen first. In primary, there was no optic nerve swelling. And normally this occurs because of lesions uh, behind the optic nerve head. So in the retrolaminar um, area, and you can just get this pale disc uh, which develops. And um, if, if it's kind of at the chiasm, then you can get it in both. Um, if it's obviously on the optic nerve, then it's only one eye. Uh, but if it's at the chiasm or beyond, then you see that optic atrophy in both eyes. And these are mainly because of compressive lesions. So uh, if the compression is happening in the chiasm or, or behind, you're not going to see a swollen disc. You just see atrophy. Or, or if it's retrovalvular, um, like so, such as gliomas and things like that. Um, hereditary, which we'll cover later, or toxic and nutritional disease. So I think get, 
you all kind of saw that a few years ago that optometrist was found guilty of manslaughter because she missed papilloma. And I think after that, there was loads of referrals. Almost anyone with a slightly abnormal disc got referred in. Um, we all understand the anxiety behind that. Uh, no one's going to ever criticize you uh, for referring a patient that you think has a swollen disc. But just in your mind, go through the system, okay? Get a history. Is there any vision loss? Any obscurations? Any uh, kind of um, pain, redness, all the stuff that we went through? Do a thorough examination. Look at the optic nerve, look for SVP, look to see if there's any retinal nerve fiber layer edema, and then basic things, color vision, uh, you know, visual field examination. Uh, you want to check the eye movements to see if any other cranial nerves are involved. Uh, pupillary reflexes. These are all kind of stuff that you have available to you when you see a patient with potentially a dodgy disc. And the relevant investigations. You all have OCT, visual field. Um, no one's expecting you to refer a patient with MRI or a B scan or, or, or you know, from the sort of presence. But use the information you have in front of you. And, you know, things like mentioning what pupils look like or color vision or in, in, in closing a Humphreys 24-2 um, can be quite important in us to be able to triage who we need to see. And of course, optic nerve uh, abnormalities, won't all, it's easy to pick up when it's affecting the optic nerve head because you can see a soul in this, but if it's behind the nerve, it can be difficult, but you still will have abnormal examination investigations. Listen to your patients because there will, the, the clue often is in the history when they present and you look at the risk factors, look at the other eye, that's often quite important. Does the other eye, you know, does the disc look pale? Is it disc at risk? Is there any, any hints you can get from the other eye to help you with the, with the first eye? And then determine the urgency for referral. Don't miss papillomia. It's, if they've got a swollen optic nerve head, or if you think the optic nerve head is elevated, um, if you're in doubt, then please refer. I think with that, I have finished. Ian, are you with us? Yeah. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. So I'm just going to try and change the view so we're uh, side by side. So thank you very much, Mr. Kshani. I was don't, don't, ask, don't, don't bother reading out Mohammed's uh, question. <laughs> so yeah, I'll I'll ask what to the, are you going to read that one? Do you want me to do that one first? Can no, you please yeah, explain yeah. POMS in regard to papilledema, please? POMS? P-H-O-M-S. Yeah, I know what it says, Ian. <laughs> Mo, can you, what do you mean by that? I've told him not to embarrass me in front of the others. He's going to get into trouble for that. Uh, in regards to papilledema, PHMS. Uh, okay, I'm sure he's going to tell me. Right. I'm sure he's going to tell me. What would be the best blood test to request GP because it's very dodgy? I think, the, I, think, I think, Lizzie, what I would say is that um, if you suspect somebody has a swollen disc, you shouldn't be going through the GP that patient needs referral to eye emergency. So I would, I would send the patient straight in. Uh, I would say if I had to choose a um, kind of vision, um, uh, one blood test, it would be ESR and CRP. But I think if anyone has an abnormal disc, i.e. a swollen disc, that's an urgent referral because essentially we want to make sure we're not missing something. You'd be worried about an arteritic um event so you do esr crp and then see if you need to do neuroimaging but that's that's the main thing so when you say urgent because my philosophy when i was taught was there's urgent via gp or emergency at the hospital do you, do you mean emergency does it yeah i think if somebody is sitting in front of you with a swollen disc that needs to be seen in the hospital not gp what's the gp going to do the gp is going to refer them on and then it's going to sit on the queue so you've got to think to yourself are you missing a gca um you know that's the main thing isn't it that's the thing that's gonna that's going to affect them so so um yes sure if you see a swollen looking this and you think oh this is probably this drusen they've got no other symptoms they've got no more vision function you know i think this is probably drusen that's fine you can you can kind of um you know send that in routinely but if you think they've got Soiling of the optic nerve head, and it could be ischemic or compressive, then yeah, we need to see that urgently. So how important is SVP in relation to diagnosing papilledema? Well, you know, it's, 
absent in 20% of normal people. So again, you have to look at the whole patient. So I wouldn't refer somebody with a normal looking disc because you can't elicit an SVP. But if you've got a swollen, if you think somebody's disc is swollen, especially you remember, you're not just looking at the disc. You start from the history, any visual symptoms, any pain, any redness, you know, anything, you know, do you see things are darker than normal? Is the vision affected? Then you do your examination. Is there any pupillary abnormality? Um, you know, anything like that. So if you've got any abnormal history or clinical examination, color vision, is the color vision abnormal? Then you, then suddenly abnormal SVP or absent SVP becomes important, especially if you think that this might look slightly solid. But if everything is normal, this looks normal, everything is fine, and you're looking at the back of the eye and you think there's no SVP, fine, 20% don't have norm, don't, 20% don't have an SVP. Mm -hmm. But in context of other things, an abnormal SVP then becomes important. It then yet adds another problem. Yeah. Or another clue to the problem. Yeah. Are acquired color vision defects more likely blue stroke yellow? In which case is Ishihari appropriate CV test? Um, I mean, yeah. So, so I, well, so first of all, test plate is quite important. So if they can see the test plate, but then nothing else, then that will tell you that the, uh, obviously the color vision is abnormal. I'm not really kind of sure if you've got kind of color blindness and obviously you can't use the color vision test. Then you look for other signs. For the most included, uh, peripheral hypertrophy ovid mass like structure. Come on, how was I supposed to know what that looked like, Mo? OCT marker for stasis. Yeah, I tell you, somebody's planted that question. You'll be having words with him next week, will you? I will be having words with him. Uh, so, I think I think is the question uh, basically uh, asking whether OCTs are good for picking up solar optic nerves. I hope that's what he's saying. Um, I I would go with clinical examination. You look for blunting of you know you look for retinal nerve fiber layer edema. Um, whether there are studies out there to correlate uh, OCT of the optic disc to level of swelling, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would not use OCT as my primary marker because don't forget your OCT is based on completely different cohort um, of patients. That's how they determine the normative data. So um, I'm not sure how, how the whole swelling thing goes into it. And, and early papilledema, you might not have retinal nerve fiber layer edema. So just because your retinal nerve fiber layers are normal, that doesn't mean you don't have papilledema. So you've got to look at the whole patient. It might be, you know, that when the disc is really swollen, then yeah, you do the OCT and you can see the retinal nerve fiber layer is way above what it should be. But I wouldn't use it as kind of, you know, um, the only thing. Yeah. Is, the, is it the ophthalmologist who carry a TAB for GCA once Bob's is? Do you have to rejoin the artery? So the ophthalmologist can do the temporary artery biopsy. No, you don't rejoin the artery. Use about uh, you. You can get skip lesions in TAB, so you have to have a good sample um, of of artery. But you have A and E doctors. Sometimes A and E consult like in Eastbourne. There's an A and E consultant that does it. Um, so variety of people can do it. But actually, we are seeing a move away from uh, TAB. They're looking at ultrasound and seeing whether you can actually see occlusion of the uh, blood um, in temporal arteries rather than doing a TAB. So um, I think with time, we probably stop doing TABs altogether. But if you're gonna do a temporal artery biopsy, you need to do it within two weeks. The reason it's important to do one, in my opinion, is because if you diagnose somebody with GCA, often they're gonna be on steroids for up to a couple of years, which can have really, you know, lots of side effects. So you need to know, you need to know for sure whether, whether it is or not. Sometimes, the clinical history is very clear, uh, but getting a positive TAB would be very useful. Conversely, if you think the clinical history is clear, but the TAB is negative, you'll still carry on. So you do have to think when you're asking it. Yeah. Perfect. I think that's all the questions. 
So thank you very much, Mr. Kashani, for that interesting talk. I'm looking forward to the next ones. Um, for all the people on here, um, we're now in CPD, which has changed from CET. So what would normally happen is that I would, after this lecture, um, confirm to GOC that this lecture happened, and then I would look, load your details and you'll be awarded a CET point where you would then have to log on and say you've accepted the point. It's all changed now, so I don't know if you've been on the CPD site yet, but you have to put your own personal CPD um, pro forma in, and there's a template for that. And what happens from here on is that I don't award you a CT point now, I will send you a certificate within 10 days to say that you've attended this talk. And then what you have to do is upload that certificate onto the CPD site to say that you've attended the talk and there's feedback you can leave about the talk as well if you enjoyed it or if you thought there was something missing or you'd like us to do differently but it's now down to you to upload the certificate on another point for that um when you register for these webinars please make sure your details are correct your first name and your surname and your goc number it's really important because that will be on your certificate and in the past, I've had people have registered and put their first name, example as Ian, and their surname of um, Samsung Galaxy Z70. And I've had to then log on to the website, the GOC, to find your real surname to put your point on. What will happen now is that will be on your certificate. So please make sure your details are correct, because when you upload that certificate, whatever you put in will be uploaded. So, um, and the GOC then will come to you and say, this certificate doesn't match your details so please 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 make sure that your first name your surname are correct and your GOC number because I've had in the past people have mistyped their GOC numbers and then I've had to look to see what your GOC number is on the GOC site so please make sure it's correct because now the certificate will be sent to you which you will upload but it needs to be correct and that's the same not just for us but I think for all CT or CPD providers. So really important if you can do that. Um, but saying that, I'll get the certificates with you within 10 days. So thank you very much, Mr. Kashani, for that interesting talk once again. And please look out for our next webinar, which I will advertise shortly, which should be the end of February. But it won't be Mr. Mr. Kashani, so um, we'll we'll miss him on that evening. But um, I'm sure all, uh, happy with joy. I will get back to more on that. I'll have to look it up. Actually, I didn't know how to answer that question. So, more I will get back on to you on that. Um, yeah, sorry about my background. We are trying to. I'm, I've been tasked to get rid of the wallpaper and color my daughter's um, room, and I've not done a very good job of it. So I'll be getting back onto that now. So for the next webinar, we'll be able to see it all decorated and nicely done. Yes. yes, I've only had a week and I haven't even done half the room yet. So it's a nightmare. <laughs> so got a few months yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks Thank again you. for doing Everybody this. Everybody for watching tonight and uh, do stay safe and take care. And we'll see you in, uh, in a couple of months or in a month for the next webinar. Thanks, dude. Take Thank care. you very much. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.